Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Two signs that we are into the off season on the Winged Wheel Podcast. One, we have to turn the AC on to cool down the studio. And we're back in studio this episode, so thank you all for putting up with one episode of uh, us being remote, and obviously the quality wasn't as good. So cool down the room. And two, us laughing before and probably going to be on the show about the Toronto Maple Leafs already with their devastation and collapse in the playoffs. People are talking about what are the Leafs going to do this offseason, and it, they're not even out of their series yet. And the entire fan base just completely loses the plot as to why they lose every playoff series they're in it is you'll get six different answers and none of them are right but watching them yell at each other over which of them is more wrong is arguably my favorite hobby and the attrition and how worn down not just the fans but these players get to the point where you have william nylander saying stop effing crying bro to mitch marner it's I haven't seen it yet, but one of my friends messaged me today and he said, Steve's LFR is a top five all time. And I have not watched it yet. And I'm just like, oh, I'm going to message him after all this settles a little bit. Just to check on his heart health. I love that. I don't know if it was on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, the flirting, but it's a podcast video. He said yes. Us. Yeah, that was great. Anyhow, spring is in the air. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, folks. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and the playoffs, all of that and lots more. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be talking to you about probably the first of many, but the most important off-season topics for Steve Eisenman and the Detroit Red Wings, which is Lucas Raymond and Moritz Sider's contract extensions. We'll be discussing how that fits into the cap structure. There's probably going to be, I can sense an argument coming on term here, as well as dollars, but term is going to be the big question and then everything else moving forward. We're going to be giving updates on the Red Wings going to the World Championships, both players and staff, as well as new contracts signed and other news. And the Grand Rapids Griffins started their playoff runoff really well, actually, with a good third period rush and then... Jan Tim Berggren being the hero in overtime. Draft lottery news, which we all love. We're, we were laughing about, you know, the this is the first year where their odds have been this low in a long time. So is there going to be all that fanfare from us about <laughs> 0.5% chance? Probably not. We'll get into a prospect profile because it is the offseason on the Wind Wheel podcast. And then we'll give you a playoff update before going into overtime. Before all that, I want to let you know that this podcast is primarily supported by our Patreon supporters patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you want to support the show you get access to some really great benefits like our bonus overtime patreon exclusive episodes you're automatically entered into all of our giveaways for example we gave away two tickets to every red wings home game this past season the vast majority going directly to our patreon supporters you also get access to our patreon exclusive discord community where you can find us hanging out having fun talking in different channels you know covering the playoff games whatever it might be it's a great community so again patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast Lucas Raymond Mortsider. Something that I think worked in the Red Wings' favor this year was Lucas Raymond's emergence. And hear me out on this. Going into this, we thought Mortsider, Red Wings' number one defenseman. We see the price for number one defenseman. Kale McCarr is an aberration. He's, he's going to be hard to hold any number one defenseman to that standard for a new contract. And we thought that number was going to be north of nine. Lucas Raymond, excelling at wing. And really kind of maybe taking a step to or past Mo Sider this year in terms of his importance to the team and their performance. I actually think he may have brought Sider's number down a bit. Is that crazy? No, because Claude Lemieux is going to definitely argue against that. I think the perspective on Mo's contract is going to look a lot different because there won't be that big of a gap that we had originally anticipated. Where it might be interesting is the term because we thought going into the season that Eisenman would do everything his power to get an eight-year contract for Mo Sider because we had a pretty good idea of what he was and what he was going to be and you want to lock him up for as long as possible at as reasonable a number as possible 
And we thought for sure Lucas Raymond was going to be a bridge because we really didn't know what he was, what his ceiling was going to be, where he was going to fit into the lineup, how important he was going to be to the team coming off a down year. Now, not not at all an option if you're Steve Eiserman. Now, that being said, and we've talked about this at length, Sider and Raymond have a lot of say in this, and they might not want to do eight years. They might want to bet on themselves. Yeah. So if you see a three, four year, maybe a five year contract come out, that's probably not coming from the Red Wings front office. But if you're Steve Eisenman, after what you've seen from Lucas Raymond, you are doing everything in your power to push out an eight year contract here. And I know it sounds dumb to say, I almost don't care what the dollar value is on that. Because I think it's going to age well no matter what. Exactly. Even if you have to severely overpay for the first two or three years. Odds are with the rising cap and him improving, it'll still be a really good deal for the back half of it. It's, it, I agree that you almost would not have entertained the notion of a shorter term contract. And we said this, you know, going back to last year too, it's going to depend on the players. And here's why, in case you're wondering why Lucas Raymond or Moritz Sider would want a shorter term deal, the cap is going up after being abnormally flat for a long time. COVID factored into that. The red, the, essentially, the Red Wings and the whole NHL was anticipating the cap to go up much sooner than this. So you're seeing increased revenues and a backlog of cap increase essentially catch up now that the players have paid off their escrow to owners, which was accrued because of all the deals they made to make sure players are paid during the COVID shutdowns. Anyhow, the cap's going to go up dramatically. So if you can get yourself paid and then paid again. Long-term deals always really benefit the team in terms of the cap hit if you're a good player. If you're a player who falls off, then obviously a team can miss out, and and that's not great. But in general, if you're a star player who's continuing to get better, which at Sider and Raymond's ages, yeah, you sign those players for as long as you can because as the cap rises, their cap hit becomes less of a percentage of your overall cap, and it's going to age really well. But if you're a player and you can set yourself up so you get paid again within your you know athletic prime and productive years you see a lot of guys try to do it so they get you know their first year of unrestricted free agency they also become uh, you know eligible and they're actually a free agent look at what toronto did look at what austin matthews did he essentially dictated his terms and and toronto's paying for that more guys are getting that kind of sense that they can get away with that rfas have been getting more practical control every year it's becoming a little bit more of a player dictated process Then you're right, Brad. Raymond and Sider have a lot of leverage because they know exactly how important they are to this team. And they're, you know, short of Larkin, the two MVPs on any given night. Well, yeah, when you when you look at Mort Sider, for example, he'll just point at the everyone else on the decor and be like, are you (laughs) sure this is what you want to be left with? It's a very compelling story for both sides, right? Like the organization clearly sees both of these players as cornerstone pieces to come out of the rebuild and compete in the playoffs. The real question to me is, what do the players want? Do they want to maximize their earning potential or do they want, you know, contract security? Do they want guaranteed money for a long, a longer period of time? And I don't really get a sense from either of them what they want. You know, with some players are like, yep, that guy is a money guy. He wants to secure the bag and he'll just be a hired gun every time his contract comes up. But these two guys, I'm not sure. But if I'm the Red Wings, I'm locking them up as long as they possibly can. And, you know, like what you guys said, the dollar amount for me doesn't totally matter because you have to have these guys on the team. Here's the thing, though. The dollar amount will matter to Steve Eiserman because the Red Wings aren't in a position, even with the cap going up next year and the year after, where everything is answered for them and they can do everything they want under the salary cap. Unfortunately, they're in a situation where they do have to probably shed at least a contract if not more and why is that well because of poor signings previous oh okay yeah Yeah, you're just making sure that we we acknowledge the fact that there's making sure that's on the record yeah justin hall's contract for example is like the one that's most earmarked for being bought out or moved Oli mata could be moved robbie fabry who's not really a guy that's like grossly overpaid and you need to move him but he could be a candidate to be moved but the red wings are, are need to be careful of every dollar here you don't know if he can bring back Perron because if he wants a number that starts with like three or more, for example, then that's going to be difficult to do. You want to be able to pay Patrick Kane if he does choose to come back to Detroit. So the Red Wings are going to care about the dollar. So 
it might be painful. And I know that, for example, Brad, this is going to make you a little red in the face. There is an advantage, even though it's not the preferred situation, but if you just acknowledge the cap situation as it is, and you, you don't sit here and cry over spilt milk, it's not, we're going to acknowledge the bad cap situation plenty this off season, trust me, but you acknowledge the situation you're in a shorter term bridge deal. Those lower dollars could help you on the side of Raymond contracts for the rest of the team navigating out of this until the cap goes up. You're objectively right about that, but it makes you mad. No, but my question is, should we care? Do we care about like being blunt? Obviously we want progress. There's a million things we want. We want to win hockey games. We want to make the playoffs, yada, yada, yada. In the big picture, the Stanley cup building picture of the Detroit Red Wings. Do we care about the next two years, the result? If it's sacrificing years ahead of it or beyond it, I care. Do I care about having to shed a couple potentially good players for future benefit? I absolutely would do that. Here's here's my hypothetical to you, and I'll throw out two situations. We'll, we'll, we'll pretend Raymond and Sider are exactly level for the sake of easy math and conversation. Would you prefer... Each of them sign a three-year by $7 million contract or a eight-year by $9.5 million contract, which I know is on the very high side. That's for, on the very high side. But this is my point. What would you prefer? You are thinking about winning a Stanley Cup with the Detroit Red Wings. Your goal is the Stanley Cup. Which uh, set of contracts are you signing? Well, to me, it's like if they're pieces of the contending team, you need to have them locked up immediately and for as long as possible. You you care about the term. This is the point you're making. Nine and a half is very rich for my blood, mm-hmm. but you care about the term. And it's still better than the bridge, which why? Because nine and a half in the next two years for Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond is probably objectively bad. They're probably going to be a little overpaid. And it's going to hurt in the short term. I understand that. But nine and a half in years three, four, five, six of this contract, where it's probably really going to matter, is probably going to be very, very good. It's probably going to be very reasonable, if not a bargain, if they continue on their trends. So what are we doing here? Do we give a crap about manipulating cap space to make the next two seasons work to maybe, maybe make the playoffs? The Red Wings, I think, care about that. They, which is, <laughs> it's an know, operational problem. Another, they, another conversation for sure. They do care and they should care and they should be trying to solve these problems in the next two years. But the solutions are not coming from Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond's contract if you can help it. I do think, okay, so I agree with the premise of what you're saying. And I think you gave a good example, but I think that was like a no middle ground example. I think there are maybe shorter term deals like five six years where you are basically borrowing a little bit from the future of Cider and Raymond, and maybe you have to pay a little bit more down the road, but by and large, it's kind of like a gray area middle ground. And I think there's space in there. Yeah. Where I come out at this essentially is like two, three years is not going to help you at all. Anything less than that shorter term, you are losing this deal. And again, I'm saying this with the full understanding that Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond might be sitting there saying, Steve Eisman, I don't want to hear a number beyond three years because I want to double dip like Jason Robertson and Austin Matthews, et cetera. Yeah. It might not be an option, but I'm saying if it is an option, anything in that contract range is a loss because you are going to have to spend so much more on those next contracts. The cap hit will be much higher than it would be now. And now your cup window is cap room just got narrower you need to make decisions for three to eight years from now i do not care about the next two if you have to jettison like i said fabry cop comfort i'm just picking okay to good players to make a better contract for mo sider and lucas raymond to make it work now you do it here's what we know about the players. First of all, they've reached this point. Lucas Raymond did well to not sign his contract before this offseason because he had a down. I don't even, I, I struggle to call it a down year. He had a normal sophomore year where he didn't take a big step and regressed in some ways in a small way. 
he lost a little bit of consistency last season. He didn't sign his contract because essentially he was betting on himself for the last year of the ELC. It's the right move. It wasn't a hard decision to make, and it paid off in spades for him. Mo Sider has taken it this far as well. If you're a player as important as he is, he's not exactly going to lose his value or his slot as the number one defenseman, and thus you know you're you're running the clock out as long as possible. You're getting more higher value comparable contracts in for you to point to. Smart move. Those are both moves that indicate that these players are looking to make sure that they get the value for their performances. It's not unheard of. It's not special. It doesn't make them greedy. This is like standard operating procedure for star young players coming out of their entry-level contracts or ELCs. Steve Eisman, here's what we know about him. He grinds. He grinds his big contracts. There's fans who, you know, drive themselves crazy because Steve Eisman in unrestricted free agency seems to be willing to overpay a million or two or by a year or two for certain guys because he feels he needs them. But with the Dylan Larkin contract, it feels good now and it looks great now at $8.7 million for the eight years that he signed. But also like we know that that was a grind and that it didn't get close, but it got kind of close. Right. And so for the big contracts, Eisman's going to grind. It's funny that we're talking about Steven Stamkos this summer as a UFA for Tampa Bay because for those who don't remember, Steven Stamkos took meetings with other teams because Eiserman set his contract price and basically didn't come off of it. He said, this is what we'll pay you in Tampa Bay. You can take it or leave it. And he was he played chicken until the very end and Stamkos came back. Like Eiserman will grind his guys, the most important players. He's not afraid to do that. He's not afraid of having a reputation as a hard ass. He's not afraid of pissing them off during the contract negotiations because that's just how he operates with Tyler Bertuzzi. Tyler Bertuzzi was asking for a number that just wasn't like Eisenman didn't even entertain the thought. They didn't even come close to contract negotiations. Essentially by December before Bertuzzi got traded, Eisenman knew that he was not long for the team. Wasn't a fan of Bertuzzi. Like the, Bertuzzi, I think, had worked his way off the team prior to that, but still. So Eisenman is going to have a tough tough negotiation in terms of what Sider and Raymond are looking at here. So this it's, it's unsurprising that we're here and I could see this going maybe not being resolved right away. I should say the only issue is you also need to resolve what you're doing with UFAs this year as well. And I think you would hope to get Sider and Raymond done first. So you know how that puzzles coming together. Do I really care all that much if David Perron, for example, walks because the Red Wings don't want to, you know, play ball with the number he, he has. No. But someone like Patrick Kane, I do care about because that's all working into the next year, next year's uh, recipe on what this team's going to be. That's the, that's where I agree with you, Evan. And in general, Brad, like what you're saying of it doesn't matter because lock them up at all terms or, or at whatever cost you can to get them for as long as possible. In general, I agree, but there are small benefits like Evan just mentioned, and that's where I think if you can borrow a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit from the future to help yourself now, is making the playoffs next year going to make them a cup team? Absolutely not. Is it relevant to 10 years from now or eight years from now or whatever Detroit's window is? In effect, in some way, yes, but in effect, big effect, no. Do I think it is important for this fan base and for this team to see the playoffs as soon as possible. I know it's nonsensical, but I think yes. I think yes. And so I don't hate, I'm not saying do it at all costs because I think that's a mistake. And that's why Detroit has gotten into some of the bad spots in the cap that they're in now with those contracts. But I, I would have a hard time coming off of this year in a hard way. Like if they regress back to an 80 point team, like that's, that's a tough scene. I think my ultimate point to to make it as clear as I can here is obviously, obviously I'm not saying the goal should be to take a step back the next two years. I would like this team to retain Kane, Perron. I would like them to sign Sider and Raymond to eight-year contracts. But I understand that as the roster sits now, if you give Patrick Kane $7 million, if you gave David Perron $3 million, if you give Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond like 18 mil combined, are you going to be able to make that work? No, I get that. My priority is the future still, and I'm not saying you can't then, if you sign Raymond and Sider to 18 mil or whatever it is combined, that you can't keep Kane and Perron, you have to shed elsewhere. The sacrifice should not be coming from Sider and Raymond to make it work. Would you rather get, again, just to throw out a hypothetical, 
Raymond and Satter on the eight-year deal we all want, but then you have to give up, let's just say, three second-round picks to unload three bad contracts. Again, hypothetically, but you save, we'll call it two to three mil per year, future Raymond and Sider deals. Three second round picks is steep. That, that's the point. I want to make it expensive. I can't imagine a GM would be willing to make such moves after they just signed. They've had one year of these contracts. That's the ultimate sign that I've made a mistake in how I execute my job, which is never a good look for anyone. No, it's a terrible look. And I'm going to the very extreme. Like you give up a second round pick to unload Andrew Kopp. You give up a second round pick to unload Justin Holt. You give up a second round pick to unload who the hell ever pick, whatever you think the next worst contract is. So in this extreme hypothetical, acknowledging it's not realistic. But yeah, this yeah is it's a- not absolutely not going to happen. But I'm just, I want to yeah, pr- yes. prove my point yeah. how valuable saving four to five million dollars a year on the cap on Raymond and Sider combined through years, we'll call it three through eight, Mm -hmm. how valuable that is when you're trying to win a Stanley Cup. We look at the Cup contenders now every year, scratching and clawing to get, teams have got within $5 of the salary cap. Like, it matters a lot. And we've seen what contenders will give up to save $5 million on a cap for one year. Remember when the Leafs gave up with the pick that turned out to be Seth Jarvis in the first round? To unload Patrick Marlowe and his $6 million for For one year. year. Yeah, but because they thought they had a good chance to win the Stanley Cup that year. So imagine you didn't have to shed that $6 million because you had already, quote unquote, saved it by signing the eight-year contracts three years earlier, right? And that's why we're like, if you can sign for eight years or even seven, that's you need to be doing that as much as possible. And like, yeah, man, the Toronto thing is so funny. It is, but like... The point being, I went to the extreme price that the Wings will never have to pay of three second round picks to be able to retain Kane Perron and still have his shot at the playoffs next year and get Sider under contract. You can probably shed the exact same amount of cap space I'm hypothesizing for a lot less than three second round picks. I think so too. Yeah. So that's my point is there, if you need to make the cap room, you can just don't have that be where you pull it from. Andrew Kopp, you are a Utah Yeti. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it rolls off the tongue, man. Yeah, I agree. I don't know why they, they're saying mammoth instead of mammoths. Wait, are they? It's it's kind of complicated. I don't hate the, the non Only one person can be a mammoth, I suppose. They have to alternate every game. Oh, so the, the, the team name isn't even about a mammoth. It's just about really big people. Yeah. It's about NFL linebackers. It, this is why I don't like mammoths. I understand it's grammatically correct, but anytime you have to throw in a THS, it just sounds weird. Yeah. You know what? You're exa- I, now that I had said that out loud, I answered yeah. my own question. We diverted and I took us that way. The, the, you qualified this, Brad, and I'm going to restate it for the sake of anyone who's, who's screaming this at their car speaker right now. This is only if Sider and Raymond are willing to hear a seven or eight year deal. If they are saying no, then – or they're naming an outrageous price to buy, you know, whatever UFA years are coming at the end of that contract. Then it's, it, this is a moot discussion, but yeah, I, and this ties into what I said last episode and what I've been saying for a long time now, which is that I want Steve Eisenman to, he has a wealth of good prospects and he has still a lot of picks left. You can't fit all of that into your system. And what have I learned in the modern NHL and rebuilding is that don't be afraid to spend. Don't be afraid to spend to fix mistakes. Don't get stuck on mistakes of the past. Don't pretend they don't exist. Don't be afraid to spend to move yourself forward aggressively. An extreme example of that, the the Vegas Golden Knights who seem to do, they, they take everything to 11 in every way in the cap and it pays off. They, they injure their own star players. They fit. Yeah, they, <laughs> they lacerated Mark Stone's spleen while he slept. They they figure it out later. And that's you can't do that forever. But if you're smart, you can do it for a long time. Don't do, you know, don't go trade a first round pick to unload Patrick Marlowe and then just get bounced from the playoffs. But you can do a lot of things by by spending when you have the luxury to do it. You can't fit every prospect in. And Brad, you said something, I think, the last episode of the episode prior. These prospects or these picks have more value earlier on because not all of them, most of them aren't going to turn out to be much. And so you're selling potential. So if you can sell potential and trade away a third, a fourth, a second here and there, or, or you know, a mid-level prospect, maybe Will Lender's a guy that people are really interested in. 
you have to give up something to get something, but if you can spend and get the best of both worlds and keep Kane and sign Cider and Raymond to the, the big money deals or whatever, do that now because you have the opportunity to do it. And you're like this hole that we talk about that the Red Wings are in, in terms of the, the cap, it's not this insurmountable thing. Like you can get out of this. It's not even the worst cap situation of, of the teams in and around Detroit's range. It just takes some doing. And that's what I want to see happen. Anyhow. Dollar values, start of the season, we said Lucas Raymond, maybe the Matt Boldy contract was comparable. That's well and gone, right? Yeah, I think Raymond's over eight now. I think so too. On a seven, eight year deal. The Larkin internal ceiling. Do you think they're going to try for that? Larkin's making 8.7. Do you think they try to say, hey, no one's going to make more than the captain? He's the MVP. And Do I think Eisenman will say that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, do I think that might work on Raymond? Possibly. Will that work on Mo Sider? Absolutely not. He's I, looking at all those other nine point something million defensemen and going, I'm better than at least two thirds of them. Okay. Okay. You're right, Brad. And I've, I conceded this point to you a while ago because I said they might be able to get him in under nine. I don't know why I'm back to being optimistic that it could possibly happen. I think they might be able to do it. If they tie him and Raymond's numbers together, I think they could do it. Is Darren McCarty conducting the negotiations? <laughs> we should all be so lucky and the Red Wings would be, we'd be able to get rid of the ad patch with the revenue they brought in from that pay-per-view. <laughs> Claude Lemieux, Darren McCarty, contract negotiations. Beyond that, I, I don't think it's, I'm not going to say realistic or possible. I'll say likely. I don't think it's likely. It's a pipe dream for me. Okay. That is the overall thought on the side and Raymond contract. It, term is going to be everything and this is going to be buried behind what the players want so we'll see as this unfolds i don't know really that anyone could confidently say at what point this is going to get done there's been nothing to indicate that this is you know far down the path i've asked around a little bit no one has any kind of indication that this is going to happen or is like 90 percent of the way there but it could happen at any time now still so, got lots of time right like free agency doesn't open till what july 1st so it's April 28th today. There's still a couple months to really grind away at this and get figure a better things out before free agency. You yeah. figure things out. You see where people kind of stand. You send out feelers. You're okay. Okay. This guy's thinking of coming back. Maybe this guy's totally out with his number and they certainly start to get a good feel on what the composition of the team might look like next year. Okay. Other Red Wings news, the world championships team USA is getting quite a few Red Wings. Dylan Larkin, Alex Lyon and net. Alex Westland, the Red Wings goalie coach, Derek Lalonde is heading over. Jeff Petrie was named after that. They're all going to represent Team USA at the World Championships, May 10th to 26th, I think the dates are. And then Lucas Raymond was also named to Team Sweden. So we'll see as the teams unfold, but the Red Wings have a good contingent going over. And you might be thinking, you know, why? And I actually asked this question too. Is like, I'm a little surprised Larkin's going, but we're also back into Olympic season. And it, that was a really good point that was made to me. And you're going to see this elsewhere. Guys who would usually skip this tournament, they want to play in the Four Nations tournament coming up, they, which is going to be the World Cup after. They want to play in the Olympics. And these teams care about if you want to play for the national program, you have to show up. Now, I think Sidney Crosby would have a lot of leeway to not show up. Like the best of the best are going to probably take the time to rest. But guys who haven't been around a while and and need to earn their keep, which is a whole generation of players, unfortunately, they're going to have to yeah, go over. So, hey, World Championships are getting some pretty loaded rosters this year compared to previous. Man, yeah. when Mitch Marner comes in in a couple of days, that lineup will be really <laughs> bolstered. Oh, man. It is like... I understand why Leafs fans hate everyone laughing at them, but it's just so... But they're also too busy yelling at each other. <laughs> Oh, God. Okay, the Red Wings also signed right-shot defenseman Andrew Gibson to a three-year entry-level contract today. Gibson had himself a nice season with the Sioux Greyhounds, putting up 12 goals and 32 assists. It was Detroit's second-round pick from last year. I believe he was 42nd overall. So, you know, good skating, puck-moving defenseman at the Sioux Greyhounds. He turned 19 this year, and we were just talking about how horrifying it is that players who we're born in 2005, have entry-level contracts now. Anyhow, from LaSalle, Ontario, which is, you know, essentially Windsor, so pretty, he'll be pretty familiar to the Red Wings and a lot of Red Wings fans. 
Six foot three, two hundred pounds. You know the mo for for Eisenman and his defenseman right shot, so they add that depth. And he also immediately gets a tryout with the Griffins to start right now. So, not like uh, it, it, this is the kind of performance you needed to see from a player of his age and ability, and having been with Sue for a little while. Yeah, the Twitter discourse around him, especially, has been overwhelmingly positive. To, to the point where I'm almost concerned it's it's getting a little ahead of itself. Andrew Gibson's a very, very good prospect. But yeah, to the point where it feels like the hype train is getting a little ahead of itself. You know, He was 0. .65 points per game as a 19-year-old on a stacked team in the OHL. For what you would consider a high-end NHL prospect, that's not an impressive stat line. And it's not to say he's not bad. He's good defensively. But he's not so elite defensively that that's going to be his only calling card in the NHL. He's he's still a big uphill battle to be an everyday NHLer. If you're not putting up points at 19 in the OHL to make the NHL, you have to be elite elite defensively. He's very good defensively. I'm not trying to diminish him, but he doesn't have that trait where you go this is why he's making the NHL. He's very well-rounded, very solid, a good performer in the OHL, but for a guy who's likely to be an everyday defenseman in the NHL. They have to be absolute locks on a shutdown defenseman or oh, about a point per game at this age minimum. Like he gets talked about like he's putting up Zane Parekh numbers yeah. when he's not even close to that. I think I think his performance was suitable for the kind of prospect we thought he was. And it's, a, it, I mean, it absolutely could have been way worse and been really bad and that would have been terrible. But no, I think he's shown... What you would have wanted to see for a player of his profile, I do think he has a lot. Like the way he skates is really good, and I, I like the way he skates in you know small bursts and and moving around in tight zones, which plays well for a defenseman who wants to be able to use his size and speed effectively in his own zone. So I do think he has that defensive upside. But yeah, you can't say he's a lock. That's the future second pair right D for Detroit. That's Brad's not wrong to call that a big uphill battle. He's a good prospect who's done well, who's earned his ELC, and and I think fans would do well to limit the hype to that for now. Yeah, we've seen guys pop at different ages before, and he's got a good foundation where it's possible. But to say that pop has happened already is crazy. Yeah, you need to, this is the game with prospects is like all of them who, you know, if you're getting drafted in the second round and then earning your ELC, you ha- you look good to some degree, but it's, it's kind of like when you grow up and then you go to college or university and you're like, oh, wow, everyone in the room is smart. Yeah, and we as Red Wings fans should be very hypersensitive to this right now. We've seen, we just went through God knows how many years of a million draft picks and a billion prospects coming through the system. How few of them are on the roster right now? And this wasn't like a super difficult roster to make over the last four years. Yeah. It is way more. What what was the most updated math on a like mid to late second round pick 44% to play 200 games or something like that. And I would say Gibson based on his statistical profile that he had this year is probably under that 44% right now. Anyhow, that's, that's all commentary. Again, it's not a knock on Andrew Gibson. Good player done. Well, congrats to him. Like it's really good. And I'm actually, anytime I see a big puck moving defenseman who shoots right i'm like oh thank goodness the system needs more of that it's just uh it's a forewarning about the discourse to say yeah this guy's guaranteed to to do it okay let us take a break here and we'll be back with you on the other side with some news about the grand rapids griffins the lottery and more but first we want to let you know that this episode of the winged wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by labat blue light Created in 1983, this premium, light Canadian Pilsner is a delicately balanced beer brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share Labatt because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. So 
Head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older, and as always, enjoy responsibly. Welcome back. The Grand Rapids Griffins. First game of the postseason, and they were down 2 nothing going into the third period, and goals from Dominic Schein and Amadeus Lombardi tied the game, and Jontin Berggren in OT for the winner for the comeback win over the Rockford Ice Hogs. On the road, fantastic result for the Griffins. They're up one nothing in that series. Kosa stopped 20 of 22 shots. Dan Watson won his first playoff game as head coach of the Griffins. And Grand Rapids pulled through. So massive result for them, especially going down 2 nothing on the road into the third period. Like, it wasn't even the best game. Like, for example, Bear Grand won. It wasn't even his best game, but showed up in that moment and, and made the difference. So Playoffs are all about moments yeah. and goaltending. They are really related to the Red Wings, aren't they? Oh, yeah. The comeback kids, junior. Hey, better than the Griffins last season, which that very much was not the case. We we always want the farm team to mimic the NHL team system, and here we are <laughs> taking it very literally. Grand Rapids takes the one nothing series lead in the best of five series. Okay, the draft lottery. Here is our next hour on our zero point five percent chance of moving up ten spots. Right, bye, everybody. Hit the button. Hit, or are we gonna, are we going to simulate it? Hit the button once. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna run a tankathon simulation once. If the Red Wings on one condition, if the Red Wings win it, I'm allowed to leave. Unfortunately, Evan, we're stuck with Brad for the rest of the episode. Anything, any terrible outcomes in the hitting of the button? Yeah, Chicago wins again. Oh my god! <laughs> Which you, is it's very likely to happen. So I I don't know what to say there. Will Gary Bettman rig the draft lottery so that Utah gets the first overall pick? If he had his way, and I actually believed he rigged draft lotteries, yes, absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Utah would get it. I don't think any of these lotteries have ever been rigged, save for 2005. It's the one hockey conspiracy I actually buy into. But it was a bad system forever, and it continues to be a bad system, and the flaws get exposed. The NHL draft lottery is on Tuesday, May 7th, and here are the draft lottery odds from lowest to highest chances of winning. St. Louis at 0.5%, Detroit at 0.5%, Pittsburgh at 1.5%, Minnesota at 2%, Philly at 2.5%, Buffalo at 3%, New Jersey at 3.5%, Calgary 5 Seattle 6 Ottawa 65 Utah Mammoth 75 <laughs> Montreal, eight and a half, Columbus, nine and a half, Anaheim, 11 and a half, Chicago, 13 and a half, San Jose, 18 and a half. Again, you can only move up 10 spots and there's stipulations on how many times teams can win in X number of years. And all these rules were put into what place. What does that matter? That doesn't matter for Detroit. No, it doesn't matter for Detroit. We've joked before. It would be so amazing. And honestly, net good thing if the Red Wings won. You can't say that fifth compared to 15th or, or wherever it is. Like, you want to draft higher up, and if the Red Wings can add that kind of asset now, what a huge boost. You get a playoff run almost, and then that asset, amazing. We will be screaming expletives that have never been heard before in human history if after all of these years, just now the Red Wings win the lottery and they can't even have the first overall pick. I still haven't reconciled whether I'd be happy or not. You have to be happy. You have to be. Objectively, it's a benefit, but it almost feels like an insult, like, Oh, all those years you wanted a first overall, huh? Best we can do is a fifth. Like. I know. I know. (laughs) I actually, even at 0.5%, I feel more confident that the Red Wings would win it now compared to before because I have like defeatist syndrome about the draft lottery. How many stupid narratives and arguments and conversations would just be gone if the Red Wings won the expected amount of draft lotteries during their they're tanking years. I mean, it, it worked out. They they overcame it by drafting Sider and Raymond. They really did in a big way. It's as if they had pick at least two for those years. But how much of the, oh, the eyes are playing. It's not done anything. They don't draft higher than like six except for one time. And they took the best player maybe in the draft. That post you put out, I, I don't remember the year, but it was within the last five. And it was the team's starting roster for the game oh yeah yeah and it had By like Taylor Swift franz Lewis. nielsen yeah like second line center it was just horrific to look at you know so. the name that really threw me 
was Alex Biega. I think it was on the top pair at the time. <laughs> oh my god! It is shocking the number of names I have forgotten in that amount of time. I and I want you to know if you've seen that post on Twitter. I didn't go and search the starting rosters and pick the worst one. I just picked an image that came up in my search, and Twitter's search function sucks. It got way worse than that. Oh yeah. Jake Chelios was on the ice at some point. He played. We were in at China. that game. <laughs> we were at that game. I forget who someone responded to your post on that with the lineup of I think it was their first ever Red Wings game they attended, and it was substantially worse. It was bad. So, anyways, that's the draft lottery. We're we're gonna try to put something together for you. We won't be in studio, but just for the sake of following along, it's not because the Red Wings are gonna win, but just because hey, it's prospect season. Worst case scenario for Macklin Celebrini. First of all, Macklin Celebrini going to the San Jose Sharks would save that team from a long and ugly rebuild, I think. it was. It's still going to be long and ugly, but they really need him. If Chicago gets Macklin Celebrini, I'm going to lose my damn mind. Will Patrick Kane go back to Chicago? Yes. Yes. Patrick Kane will take a discount to go back to Chicago, and Chicago would be stupid to not sign him because they've seen what Patrick Kane can do with a competent center. You can flip him between Bedard and Celebrini if you want all year. I don't like any of this. Let's no. move on. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Okay. Speaking of the draft, let's talk about our prospect profile for today's episode. We're going to try to do these consistently leading up to the draft. We might have to double up, but not every player is going to be the most relevant to the Red Wings because they're likely drafting 15th. But we want you to know about who's at the top of the draft, and you never know the way these things shake out. Players drop it, all the time. If the Red Wings move up to 5th, then maybe some of these players become relevant. As, and you know what? Who are we if we're not going to equip you for the 0.5% chance of happiness, which is kind of like the tagline for this entire podcast over the last nine years. Zeev Booyam, who is a really, really highly talented player playing for Denver in the NCAA, had himself a national championship playing with his brother Shai Booyam, who obviously is a Red Wings second round draft pick of the past. But Zeev Booyam has a much higher profile left shot defenseman not consensus where he goes like he has a big range i've seen him top five i've seen him as low as like 13 but everyone seems to agree that he has a lot of potential so who is zeev booyam as a defenseman as a prospect well what makes booyam fascinating is when you look at the individual tools skating it's pretty good really good not elite the passing and the stick handling and the shot all very good not elite He's one of those guys, and even his defending for a for a quote unquote offensive defenseman isn't terrible. It's not the black hole that you often see with these like super high scoring defensemen. But then you look at the the toolkit and you know the pretty good defensive game, and generally these types of defensemen are a dime a dozen. So why is this guy in the top ten? That's because he might be the smartest player in the draft. He has unbelievably high hockey IQ. And when you combine that with a lot of above average traits, that creates an elite player because he has, his skills are good enough to execute what he sees out there. And he sees a lot more on the ice than your average, you know, 18, 19 year old defenseman does. Not the same situation. I know, but I'm going to repeat to you what I said pre-show Brad. Remember Quinn Hughes and we thought his size would stop his potential from being reached? We know, we all know the story with the Red Wings. Quinn Hughes wasn't on their list. Ken Holland said it was going to be Evan Bouchard. If not, then Dobson or Boakfist. It wasn't going to be Quinn Hughes. They took Zadina. We know how that one went. But as a Red Wings fan, you can't, even if you know the reality and you think the discourse is stupid, it still hurts to see what Quinn Hughes is doing and knowing that the Red Wings could have seen him, watched his game so easily and, and scouted him better. Zeev Booyam, to me, like there's there's analogs to that in terms of the evaluation. He thinks the game that well, and I think what he does offensively is is good enough where I'm like, he could be an explosive player. I think he has an outside shot at being a game breaker. I think anyone with that kind of hockey IQ does. And the fact that he's not completely deficient, like he's not like a black hole defensively, I don't know, man. I lean much more towards the higher end of his stock in terms of being a potential top five to eight or whatever pick. I uh, that's that's where he strikes me, and that's a little bit because I've been hurt before. I think he's going to go way higher than eighth. I think just the way he thinks the game and his continual progression while being one of the youngest players in the leagues he's in is going to make GMs go crazy for him. 
he so I pulled up some of the stats. He led the team in scoring with 49 points in 40 games. He's a defenseman. He this was the th- 49 points were the third most by a U19 defenseman in NCAA history and most since 1983. That's so not bad. To, to say he had an okay season would be an understatement. I I just think the meteoric rise he's on right now, he's a bolt-on top five f- first defenseman to go for sure. But but the thing is, if you're leading your team in scoring as a underage defenseman, that team must suck, right? National title. Oh yeah, that's an interesting fact to go along with those stats. But there's some people who ride who ride a good team to a national title. But Zeev Buyam was he was the talk of the whole team all year. He led the, he led the national yeah. champions in scoring as yeah. a defenseman. So yeah, I don't know. Let's just to get crazy here. Would you trade up to to take Zeev Buyam if he starts to fall and it's you know reasonable? Spoiler for leading up to the draft. I'm going to be a big trade up proponent this year. Oh hell yeah, I love chaos, Brad. I do not give a crap about B-level prospects or second, third, fourth, fifth round picks anymore. Obviously, I understand value to them still. We know what this team is deficient in, and it's not depth. They need stars. I think Booyam will be too high Mm -hmm. for what would be affordable in a trade-up, because I think Evan's right. I think he's probably going somewhere between three and seven, if I had to guess, right now, today. If he's there at seven, I'm making a big, big Push. splash to make him. You'll try. I have my trade-up candidate circled already for the Red Wings. It's not Booyam, because, again, I think it'll be too expensive. It's a guy I think that'll go in the 10 to 13 range, and I don't know if you want me to spoil that now or for later. but No, we'll save it. We'll save it. So it, it feels more of a bigger need for the Red Wings as well, different position, but... If Booyam somehow gets to like 9, 10, 11, if the Red Wings aren't calling, not that a team would accept it because most teams, if they have a chance for Zeev Booyam, they'll sprint to the stage to pick him. Yeah. So they're not going to answer Iserman's calls even if he he does, but he should try. Yeah. Well, when they when the draft lottery moved to five, it's not a huge jump up. Then so you can like trade you back know, to seven. To yeah, seven. you can trade back. There's lots of possibilities. <laughs> well, it's going to be a weird draft because there's, what, a non-zero chance that Celebrini goes first and then the next, what, five or six picks are defensemen? Could be, yeah. And given that the Red Wings need a forward, that might actually play in their favor really well this draft. The only other forward I've done a deep dive on right now is Demidov, and he looks so good. Yeah. I, it'll never happen, but, like, he looks... if the Red Wings win the draft lottery, hypothetically... I think Demidov's my guy. It could, and that could very well be where he goes. Yeah. The the shy Booyam Zeev Booyam. Like we, there should be like, hey, we have your brother. I'm Bring hoping he has character issues that he just tells every <laughs> other team, I'm not signing with you. I'm going to play with my brother. The scouts are like, yeah, he had no character issues all year. It was only when it came to interview time. And it's just him like negotiating his way to Michigan, he just, Eric Lindros style. Yeah, he just walks into the room with a picture of his brother wearing a Red Wings jersey going, any questions? Come home. <laughs> Come home, Zeev. Okay, imagine Edvinson, not necessarily these pairings, but like, okay, Zeev, Booya, Mo Sider, Edvinson, Axel Sinti, Dean Pelica, top four. Well, you'd have to trade one because we have a salary cap <laughs> yeah. and because you guys are big fans of the salary all, cap. All of a sudden, Evan, I'm starting well, to hold on. Oh, wow, very wow. sympathetic to your cause. Hold on. Of those four, which of them are most likely to efficiently recover from a lacerated spleen? <laughs> this Mo is Sider. True. Mo Sider has demonstrated that he can survive everything. And honestly, the way he plays, he could probably use a break leading up to playoff time. Yes. And those other three are good enough to hold the fort till we get down there. This is how we win the Stanley Cup. Okay. Let's move on to the playoffs. That was Zeev Bui, and we're going to continue these prospect profiles. The NHL playoffs. A good friend of our a good friend of the show and you know does a lot of great work in the hockey and media space in Toronto Adam Lascaris he he always says nice things about the show he texts me nice things i think my mom puts him up to it and i always feel bad anytime we dunk on the leafs because adam is probably like i can't escape this and i'm listening to the show to know more about the red wings and the rest of the league <laughs> it's payback for the draft lottery joke that that's very true screw off adam anyhow the Leafs are down 3-1 in this series, and I can't say from the point the series started to now that that should be a shock to anyone. Not only that, I think Brad Marchand said at some point in Game 3, he said this game is this series is over in 5. <laughs> and I believed him. I believe him too. It's 3-1. 
The he, only thing is, yeah, he's got the series right at this point. Oh my god. This isn't even a conversation about this series at this point. It's a uh, why does this keep happening to them? On talent, they should not be this team. Is it a media problem? Is it a coaching problem? Is it a player problem? Is it a character problem? I don't think there's a goaltending problem. Though. Like what is the issue with this team and I think I've I think I've come to terms on two things that I'm going to isolate. Coaching, goaltending. Down goes Brown brought up a great point that doesn't get brought up enough. In the Austin Matthews era, how many series have the Leafs been a part of where they definitely had the better goaltender? The number he came up with was zero. It has to be zero. Was zero. And then you look at all the... David men- Ayers wouldn't even be their worst goalie. Yeah, but didn't they lose a playoff series to Montreal? Uh, Carey Price. Yeah, but that still, was the year. that Carey team was Price. terrible. It was a gas leak year. Yeah. That was Jack Campbell against Carey Price, that series. But th- I come back to Sheldon Keefe because this team very obviously is mentally fragile. Like, yes. Very obviously. Yes. yes. That's on the coach. You can you can build whatever roster you want, but if they fall apart like they do every year, and the crazy thing is, it's not even like they're bad. Mitch Marner, go look at his playoff numbers. I promise you, you're going to be surprised because they're higher than you think they are. They're not his regular season numbers, but they're not terrible. Same with Austin Matthews. William Nylander might be the best of them for keeping up playoff production. Like, so how does this keep happening? Obviously, this year, Tree Living, I'd say in terms of roster construction, took them a step backwards. But it's like with a proper coach, with a Craig Berube type, does this keep happening to them? I, my genuine theory is no. My God, they could get Mike Babcock. <laughs> that was its own unique brand of screwing up teams because I still argue the Red Wings should have had at least three cups in his tenure, but that's a whole nother thing. I disagree with you, Brad. Not on the points you made, but that you can isolate it to those two things. The Leafs as okay, they were... sorry, not isolate. Primary reasons. Yeah, that, that's fair. But I think the Leafs as they were constructed, I think running it back, and this isn't to say, oh, getting rid of Kyle Dubas and Shanahan winning that power struggle is what screwed the team. I don't even know that Dubas was doing the right things too. But the... The Leafs running this back this season, colossal mistake. The Leafs running it back last season, I will say was a mistake. The Leafs running it back this season prior, I think was a mistake. They have seen, they have never been close to realizing the potential in terms of if you try to stack all the talent on one bar on on the graph, they they don't realize an iota of the potential that they should have. The construction of the roster as it is right now does not make sense. And they had to make a decision a long time ago on how to maximize that value. And that conversation has been for a long time, Mitch Marner. And I still think that's the direction they need to go. I, because I think they, they, they would have been well, able to get now. They would have been able to get more before and have a lot more control over the situation. But, and, and Marner's stock, depending on who you talk to is, <laughs> is, is a little bit of a William Nylander said to Mitch Marner on the bench, <laughs> stop effing crying, bro. But he should be thanking him for taking the heat off Nylander for missing the first few games with his migraines. They they needed to shake up their roster, fix their holes on defense, fix their holes at goaltending, and a lot of other things that Brad mentioned, and they needed to offload the offensive salary and talent that they had to, to facilitate that. That's a tough decision to make, but teams who are shrewd and make those tough decisions like the Vegas Golden Knights are the ones who excel and teams who are afraid of doing anything other than the status quo are the ones who are stuck never accomplishing anything like the Toronto Maple Leafs who have still not played a hockey game in the month of June. The Leafs like to make moves in the margins. They like to bring in Labushkin twice. They like to bring in, they like to have the Ryan Reeves experiment. They want to bring in Patrick Marlowe. You know, maybe they need to take a look at the Vegas Golden Knights, for example, and say, maybe we just need to do something crazy. Maybe we just got to really make a move that says, like, we're shaking this thing up and they bring in an all-star level goalie or they make they bring in an Eric Carlson, for example. I don't know. Maybe that's something they need to do because this, like, sort of moving around, just you keeping the core together doesn't seem to be working for them. Yeah, the... 
first few years of this core for them, I was a big proponent of you have Tavares, Nylander, Marner, Matthews. Those, those players are so elite. You can make this work around them. Their GMs have proven, no, you can't. And I don't think it's because you can't. I think it's because they're, they were just not great and making terrible moves in the margins and not addressing major obvious flaws. And I can't wait for this offseason because we've all seen the same Twitter discourse. Should the Leafs move one of their core four and use that $11, $12 million, whichever player you pick, to spend on a $6 million and a $5 million defenseman or something like that? I say yes. And to me, the answer of who that should be is extremely obvious. John Tavares. <laughs> He's only got one year left. It's so funny because they thought he was going to be the answer to everything. He hasn't even been bad, no. but he's old and he's got one year left. But here's the thing that you don't see in any of this Twitter discourse, because I know everybody was like thinking I was teeing up Mitch Marner there. They both have one year left. Marner's a lot younger and a lot better. Both of them have no move clauses. Yeah. You think either of them are going to waive it? No chance. Paul you, would never allow that. Yeah, you, you bring Babcock back in. <laughs> He bullies Mitch Marner to lift his no-move clause. Bam, you got a trade set up. Because these players aren't stupid. They know they're also playing for their next contract. And if you go, hey, could you waive it to go to I don't care what team? They're going to go, you want to pull me away from Austin Matthews and Willie Nylander in a contract year? No, I need those stats, my guy. So I think the Leafs eventually will use Tavares or Marner's money to solve the rest of the glaring holes in their roster, but they're going to have to wait a year to do it. We're talking about the least as if they're out. It's 3-1. They're out. They're out, yeah. I honestly hope this ages poorly because I think that'd be entertaining. But yeah, Boston's 3-1 and Brad Marchand doesn't look to be a guy who's incorrect. I don't even think Boston's been all that good. No, they haven't. No, they've but just, the, they, it's, they have, it's the six inches between the years, and Boston has them. They know how to play in the playoffs. They it's have them this, stuffed into their locker. It's yes. not even that. You could almost narrow this series down to the, it's the six feet between the goalposts. Yeah, Swayman especially. Yeah, like the, the Leafs goalies haven't been particularly terrible, but the Bruins goalies have been a hell of a lot better. What stupid speech do I give? The playoffs are all about... Like it's about individual moments and it's not about, you know, who's been better on average and how the whole game has gone is who steps up and you can isolate one single moment and say that's random, but it's, it's not a trend as to why the Boston's and previously the Tampa Bay's, et cetera, they stepped up when they needed to. It comes with experience. It comes with the right kind of players and it comes with guys who aren't sorry, soft. And I don't mean they hit hard. I mean like they show up in big moments when it gets tough. Anyhow, Boston up 3-1 on Toronto. The Rangers up 3-0 on Washington. Carolina's up 3-1 on the Islanders, who saved their season with an overtime goal. Florida's up 3-1 on Tampa Bay, and that one got to 3-0, which was surprising. Edmonton, 2-1 over LA. Vancouver, 2-1 over Nashville. Winnipeg losing 3-1 to Colorado. And Vegas, 2-1 to Dallas. Dallas kept that series in play with that Wyatt Johnston OT goal. Last night, currently the ongoing scores, because I I was reading that as of the time of recording, 7 p.m. on Sunday. The Preds are up 2-1 on Vancouver at the end of the second. The Avalanche had beat the Jets today to go up 3-1. The Rangers and Caps play later, and the Oilers and Kings play later tonight. So one of those series might be over by the time you hear this episode. Elsewhere in the playoffs, any big surprises? I, I, I did pick Florida to win, but I'm surprised they took advantage the way they did in this series. Yeah, maybe I'm surprised. I thought Tampa, you know, given their experience and whatnot, would put up more of an effort. I think last game they started to get their stuff, their act together a little bit more. But man, Florida's just, they're insufferable in so many ways. Yes. Yeah. The other one uh, that I've found very surprising that we talked about off air is Colorado and Winnipeg. Oh, God. I was like, yep, Winnipeg, hot coming into the playoffs, looking good. And now what, what's the series at? It's a 3-1. 3-1 for the Avalanche, yeah. And it hasn't looked good for Winnipeg in a long time. No. The last two losses were, we'll call them statements. Vancouver's on their third goalie right now. Yep. That's not a great sign. Edmonton, they- Hold fought. on, I want to stay on Vancouver for one sec, because all year the narrative was around, eventually the PDO bender is going to run out. They won a game getting 12 shots on net in the playoffs. This team is breaking 
every analytical model alive. Like it's going to be rough when that city burns when they make the finals again. It's going. I'd be- say no way because they are definitely overperforming expectations, but. It doesn't stop, so I I can't question it at this point. I am so happy that Dallas won last night. Not because I, I want to root for Dallas or anything, but I'm like, those two teams are too good for that series to end fast. However it ends, it ends. I don't care about my bracket. I don't care about my picks. But those are two. Those two that could be a Stanley Cup final series. That's how talented those two teams are. So I am happy that Dallas won in OT and at least made it a series. We need Dallas to win for the integrity of the of professional hockey. If <laughs> Vegas wins, though, first of all, we, we still have to have that conversation. But if Vegas wins, I think it will be very funny. They're the evil empire right now. I will not listen for another team. If Vegas wins, more and more teams will learn that you just need to go buck wild and go balls to the wall as a GM. Be like Chaos Brad. Just do crazy stuff and stop sitting still. I think that's what Vegas winning will do. And also injuring your own players. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was alluding to. We'll have that conversation in the future. Okay, before we move on here, we want to, of course, acknowledge the passing of Bob Cole, one of the most prolific play-by-play voices in the history of the NHL. And for a lot of people, one of the main voices that they hear in their head when they think of hockey games and how they were called passed at the age of 90 and just an incredibly giant presence in the world of hockey an amazing loss for the community in terms of, of the impact that he brought and, and now is gone like bob cole has you can look at any sector of the hockey world in terms of gms players coaches play-by-play announcers media analysts everyone has a story about how bob cole impacted or inspired them or how he connected with them as people so uh, just a a huge loss for the hockey community and not enough can be said about the kind of impact that bob cole had on a lot of our childhoods really calling the game of hockey well that was the point i was gonna make is i grew up in the 90s early 2000s i didn't have the ability to get the red wings home feed till i was almost an adult already so bob cole was the voice of my childhood. I was that stereotypical Canadian kid. Saturday night, it was hockey night in Canada. Oh, I'm home from school and I got nothing going on that night. I'm watching hockey. And it was Bob Cole for most of those games. And he was the best. His enthusiasm and excitement level. And there's just something to an announcer who's just as into the game as you are. Mm -hmm. And... You know, some of his, if you actually listen to the words that come out of his mouth on some of the most iconic goal calls, it's, it's borderline gibberish. And that makes it better because he's just in the moment, you know, like the Mario Lemieux goal in the, what was it? 91 or 92 cup finals. Lemieux, look at Lemieux. Oh, baby. Like iconic. He, he captured the moment and the energy And that's not an easy thing to do. Like you can call and you can describe a play, but you're exactly right, Brad. It's not about having the most eloquent sentence. It's knowing, you know, when to pick it up and when to let the moment speak for itself and when to ride the energy of the moment or or when to, you know, tell the the viewer exactly what they were looking at. I think the big moments is what people, what they think about when they think of an announcer and he, his voice is like, yeah, it's the one a lot of people imagine. Well, even what was it? Uh, 97, the double OT Eisenman goal. Like there's a Bob Cole call for it. And it's arguably just as good, if not better. And all he said was Eisenman scores, Detroit wins. Like that's, but the, the emotion, the enthusiasm, the everything coming through that call was incredible. Rest in peace to Bob Cole and condolences to his family and friends. Okay, let's jump into overtime. Overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to support the show. Again, you get access to some really great benefits like our bonus overtime episodes, which record right after these main ones. You also get access to the Patreon exclusive Discord and you're automatically entered into all of our giveaways. You allow us to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation, continue to produce this show and make it bigger and better and work on some really cool things for the future as well. You allow us to produce other great content like Expected by Whom, a show recorded and hosted by Prashanth Iyer and Sean Shapiro. Go give them a follow and tune in. It's a fantastic show. So again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. 
Frank, the tank says, depending on which teams are eliminated in the first round next week, besides Washington and the Islanders, which team is most likely to blow it up after the first round exit? Between Washington and the Islanders? No, no, excluding them. Oh, I was going to say, because Lou Amarillo is too stubborn and Ovechkin's on the goal chase. So I don't even think either of them will. I think the honest answer here is Toronto. To find blow it up, though, right? They'll make changes, but... All their big pieces have no move clauses. They can't blow it up unless they're willing, which might be Winnipeg, to be honest. But they just extended Shifley and Hellebuck in. eight years. And they can't. They, they you guys fin- wanted crazy. <laughs> they financially cannot afford to blow it up. Like they are afraid yeah. of not having season ticket holders. I mean, running through the teams in my head here, the one team where it would the kind of sort of. But again, Sergachev, Sorelli, Hagel, like they got a lot of long-term deals. The team where it makes the most sense is not losing in the first round, so they're not going to blow it up, which I would say Boston is probably the closest because they don't have as many long-term commitments. They're an older team. But they're not losing. No, exactly. So they're not going to blow it up. The answer here is I think none. I don't think any of these 16 teams are blowing it up. They're all going to make changes, every one of them that doesn't win the Stanley Cup. But it's going to be more refining around the edges. Lars Thorzell, our good friend Lars, says, Hello, boys. No offseason is without dumb trade proposals. Here we go. Lars, this is a, it's a good example. It says, would you trade more insider for Mitch Marner one for one? No. Good God, no. We have defensive prospects in the pipeline. Granted, not as fantastic as Sider, but a Marner we don't have. I wouldn't do it. However, would you? Even just age discrepancy, contract discrepancy. With an eight-year extension at a discounted rate because I do think the wings with what they have in the system could patch work a defense here, but they definitely don't have a forward of Mitch Marner's talent level. But then there's the whole mental fragility thing. Is that real? And the age thing ciders a lot younger. Like I wouldn't do it. There's a world where a trade could make sense, but one for one, not even considering it. All right. Next question here from Joseph Barry, and we talked about this a little bit, but I think it's an interesting flip side to it. It says, do you guys think Detroit should move pick 15 for immediate help now, or should they wait and see who's available? Thanks, boys, and keep up the great work. Long-term play is still the play. The Red Wings are not a sell premium assets for short-term help. I really, but the thing is, That premium asset could still be buying help that is not necessarily that short term. Like if you're paying for a young player still in his early RFA years or ELC. If that's the main piece in a Trevor Zegers trade, absolutely. But realistically speaking, probably not. Yeah. If you're getting someone who's going to help you for, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight years that we know is good. Yeah, that's more likely to pan out than whoever they pick at 15th overall. That's just the odds of it. But if you're getting, if you're making that trade for, we'll call it two years, hypothetically of a Mitch Marner type. No, that doesn't make sense. Jack's dad has Riz no cap and his drip is lit. Wow. Thank you for making me read that out loud. I'm going to go take a bath says, actually I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. And now what I'm with, isn't it. Each of you can edit and what's one. It seems weird and scary to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Each of you can edit one thing Eiserman has done during his tenure, whether it's going after this guy versus that guy, re-signing or letting go of a player, editing trade packages, whatever. What do you do and justify how it would make the team better? Okay, I have to ask. If we're talking about stuff related to the draft, does that mean I get to pick what I'm doing with those picks? I'll limit you to one pick. Well, that kind of takes out, I love Sebastian Cosa, but if I could reverse that trade and take who Dallas took in Johnston and Stankovin, I'm doing that in a heartbeat. Now, I don't think that's Eisenman's worst move because Cosa is a very, 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 very good prospect, but Stankovin and Wyatt Johnston long-term would be the most value Eisenman could have got in something that he obviously traded out of. Beyond that, I'm just not signing the Andrew Kopp contract, like just not signing it. Yeah. I think one less Albatross contract right now would be a big help. That Kosa one, that's a good pull because they, yeah. that's a hard one to call because Kosa, again, is very good and we love him. But those two players, man. That that could be 60 to 80 goals a year but between they, those two players alone. They're both 21 and under, which is insane. 
Coase is great and probably going to be great, but the only likely way that trade isn't a loss for the Red Wings even then is if Coase starts winning Vezinas. Evan? Yeah, I was going to go with one of the Albatross contracts. You know, maybe the Justin Hall is the one. Andrew Kopp is the obvious one. And you could, there's always nice revisionist history with the with the draft. But just to, for the sake of being different, I'll go with Justin Hall. It's funny. I, I can't remember if it was off or on air, Brad, or it might have been an overtime episode. But you acknowledged and we were talking. It's like, yeah, we needle in on the things that have gone wrong more often than not because that's what's standing in the way of what's going to happen in this offseason. But by and large, you remove the UFA signings, like some of them. Eisman's done a great job. So it's really funny that the best answer to this question is one where you undo a good pick that he made. Take out Sherratt, Cop, Hole. Are we criticizing his G- his tenure at all? Like at all. Even without those three Albatross contracts, he still made some bad moves. But they're so minor that they wouldn't matter. The Like a normal amount for a GM. Exactly. All right, last one here. And this is an obvious one. Known Petrie Truth with the Mex Canadian says, just need you guys to sell a discussion I had with my work friend. Who would win this fight? Sherratt Sider, Edvinson Rasmussen versus Rempe Cole Reeves Wilson. It's Rempe Cole Reeves Wilson by a country mile. We're talking physical fight or are they playing a four on four hockey game? Fight. Oh, yeah. the, the Those guys are crushing the Red Wings guys. I don't even think Rempe is a good fighter, but if you're a fighter, it's different. You just different. took the fighting all-stars and put them against the Red Wings. <laughs> Who don't have a fighter. Yeah. Sider, one career fight. Rasmussen, uh, he's got a few, didn't do particularly well in most of them. Sherratt, I don't remember if he's been in a fight. So if he has. Yeah, he has, but it's, a, they're they, just big. They, they haven't been beat downs. Yeah, like, it's Reeves. He might be able to take two of those guys. By the end of the fight, it would look like Thanos came through. <laughs> You'd be hard, like. What other players are you going to pull from the league that are going to stand up to those guys? <laughs> There's not many. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Ryan Reeves is the worst hockey player in the NHL by a lot. But if we're talking about fighting, dude can bang. Like, it's not going to go well for whoever he's up against. He's scary, man. All right, as we wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we'd like to thank you all so very much for tuning in. If you're a new listener, welcome to the show. It's going to be a fun off season, as you've seen. There's there's no shortage of discussion. And if you're a listener of old, thank you for staying tuned. And this is probably going to be really cool to see an off season start so late. So we hope you're enjoying that. But we really, really appreciate all of you for tuning in. Let's thank also Labat Blue Light for supporting the show. And to all of our Patreon supporters, we could not do this without you. If you want to support us on Patreon, it means the world to us. Patreon.com slash Wheel Podcast. And if Patreon's not for you, that's okay. Other ways to support the show is give us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, thumbs up on YouTube, and subscribe wherever you are as well. And tell a friend about the show. To all of our name level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Victor Zetterberg, Brad's Lord and Savior, Bradley Cleveland, Glenn Brabham, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Avery's Sloppy Seconds, Beep, Brian Vasha, Carl Brutina Nanaluski, Carl Provi, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek, Derek Enstam. Derek is a brand new name level supporter. Welcome, Derek, to the Dub Dub Club. Cider, comma, Dickens, formerly Wireland, Winchester. DJ Denton, God Creatives, Give Blood, Fight Probert. Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt. Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kaylin Wood, Marcus, Matt Keeler, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, RA, Ryan, 50, Hannah Cap, Hannah, Scott Martin, Skeletor, Scree and Lube. That's what I appreciate it's about you. Utah Storm and Mormons, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Eyes Are Playing Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, AB, Adam Rose, Axel Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Brad Simmons, Shy Town Wings fan, Chuck Buff Chest, the Tarp Lascoon, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor Layton, and Corey Prita, Darren Fick, Derek James, Eric Nance, brand new name level supporter, Evans Fourth Putt, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, Joey Jojo Shabadoo, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Known Petrie Truth of the Mexinadian, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Michigan Boy Navs Country, Mitch Marner, more like Mitch Softer, nice, got him, Reed, 
Naruto's Punchable Face, O Ophelia, Red Wing Tar Heel, Salt Lake Sugar Girly, Sean Mason, brand new name level supporter, and Steven, as well as the Hodag. The Stanley Cup is a hyper trophy. The Hat 123, Tom Iserplan, Respector, Throw the Roadpus, brand new name level supporter and fantastic name. Wings fan in St. Louis, Scott, and your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.